Hi, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use, and also our own cultural stories and perspectives growing up in the U.S. in a Persian family. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to episode number 20. I am here with Bita Jun, and we are talking about Persian weddings today and the role of food in Persian weddings and ceremonies. We are super excited because we have our first guest on this show, We thought it would only be appropriate to pull in an expert to talk to us about Persian weddings. And we have Miss Nilu Nuri of Nilu Weddings here today to talk to us about Persian weddings. Nilu Jun has a full service wedding and design and planning company, and she is an award winning wedding officiant. And we are super excited to have her here today. Hi, Nilu Jun. Hi, Bita Jun. Thank you to both Bita Jun and Bita Jun. I'm honored to be here. Hi, ladies. It's so good to have you, our very first official guest, hopefully of many more. And thank you for joining us. I'm super excited to talk about weddings. Yeah, Persian weddings are so fun. You know, Bita and I were talking about how it's just been such a bummer that we haven't been able to participate in big in-person weddings. Persian weddings traditionally are pretty big weddings. Everyone has a lot of friends and family that like to participate, but it really kind of depends on the individual couples on the size of the wedding, the rituals and ceremonies that they want to incorporate. And I know that everyone's wedding is a little bit different. What's the defining factor of a Persian wedding? What are some of the things that like every Persian wedding has? First of all, I just want to say this is a fun opportunity just to think about weddings because I, for one, really miss them. I love them. They're so fun. They just give a, such a good energy and a hope. And being in a world pandemic, things are obviously different now. So we're thinking back to when we could gather in big groups. But one of my favorite parts about Persian weddings is just the over-the-topness, the elegance. It's an occasion to dress up in your finest. And you can't overdress, in my opinion, for a Persian wedding. I don't think there's any such thing of as overdressing. <laughs> Pull out all your jewelry. Not to say that they are, you know, superficial. I think that there's a lot of meaning behind Persian weddings, but the dancing, the energy, the traditions, the food, it's just so much fun. It just fills me up. So Bita June, why don't you share what you love about Persian weddings? Like we, we were both so excited about getting to talk about this. Yeah. So I think the defining thing for me when I think about a Persian wedding is the sofre act is this beautiful setting that has a bunch of different elements on it that all symbolize something that is part of the wedding ceremony that the bride and groom actually sit at this low table. Typically, a lot of the elements are food based, some of them are just traditional. And it's great that it actually is not a religious setting. It's really kind of dates back to like Zoroastrian times. I know Nidhi Jun can help us talk about that a little bit more. But I think for me, the defining factor of a Persian wedding is the beautiful Sofre Act that the wedding ceremony actually takes place at. Yes, thank you both for your insights and your experience. You know, obviously Iranians are fun-loving people, as you as you both know, and they will take any opportunity to celebrate. Uh, so when it's a celebration of love between, you know, the sons or daughters of a family, then that's even bigger and so much uh, grander and more important. So they do go all out, as Bita Jun mentioned. It's probably one of the most important celebrations uh, in a family's uh, life and, and really in our culture too. What I love about Persian weddings, and especially as, as an officiant, you know, I started my work in the wedding uh, industry initially as an officiant. And what I love about it is that it really highlights the most beautiful part of our culture, which is poetry, celebration of nature, love, and as Bita Jun mentioned about the Sofre Art, for example, the ceremony spread, you know, every item on that spread points to, again, to either nature or divinity, love, poetry, beauty, abundance. It's all the best wishes that we want for the couple. It's all kind of put together in this beautiful symbolic spread. 
Yeah. Bita June, did you have a Sofri Ahd at your wedding? I did, yeah. Persian weddings, they can be really ornate. I just wanted to have the basics, and I was really into the meaning of each thing. So I did marry an Iranian man and into an Iranian family, but we have many, you know, Western American friends, and we did a combination of cultures. I had bridesmaids, but we wanted to make it be a Persian wedding, but have some of the traditions that I became accustomed to growing up here in the U.S. And so it was simple and beautiful. And in my program, I listed all of the meanings of everything. How about you? Yeah, I had a Sofre Akhtu. My husband is not Persian. So we did like a cross-cultural wedding. This was uh, when I was living in New York. We got married actually at a, the Brooklyn Winery. We had a, a more simple Sofre Akhtu. And there were just some of the elements that I just really wanted to incorporate, specifically like the sugar ceremony and also the honey at the end of the wedding. So the sugar ceremony is basically the bride and groom sit down on a low bench and there's a piece of special fabric or kind of lacy fabric that traditionally it's happily married woman. Is that correct, Nina Jun? The traditional way is happily married women hold the ends of this fabric. You know, I have to say every family has their own tradition when it comes to that. Yes. But yes, many uh, believe that it should be held by happily married women, although some believe that it should be held by, you know, women of uh, marriageable age or women who are eligible to be married oh okay that's awesome so we kind of took our own approach to it too i had bridesmaids as well i had the bridesmaids were holding the fabric over our heads and my mother and my husband's mother were the people who actually grinded the sugar so what that means is basically there's two cones kind of made out of sugar. So if you think of like a sugar cube, but a large one made into the shape of a cone, and that's wrapped in lace. And what the sugar ceremony is, is that these two cones, the bottom of them are rubbed against each other and making that solid piece of sugar into just granular sugar that all falls onto this fabric that is being held over the bride and groom's heads. And what that is, is adding sweetness to their life. It's symbolic of adding sweetness to their lives. And so for us, what we did during that time is we had two different people read poetry while there were the sugar was being ground. And that was our version of the Ghan Sabidan ceremony. But as Andy Jun was saying, I guess everyone can kind of customize that to however way that they want. Yeah, my bridesmaids also took turns. Uh-huh. So they had the instructions of holding the thing and taking turns grinding the sugar to rain sweetness down on the couple. But somehow it ended up taking so long that they were just laughing inside and kind of also dying inside. They, they joked later that they should have done some arm workouts, that it was so tiring. I don't know how they did their rotation, but uh-huh. to this day, they remember that holding the big sugar and grinding was actually quite a fitness feat. This ritual symbolizes adding sweetness to the couple's life and marriage. But also another symbolism is that each of those cones represent bride and groom. And we are hoping that every contact between them results in sweetness. Mm. So beautiful. I hadn't heard that before. I love that. And I love that nowadays bridesmaids are involved in this ritual. And especially, you know, I always tell my couples that especially mixed couples who are marrying, you know, uh, their partners from outside of the Persian culture, I tell them that this ritual is so easy and beautiful and meaningful. And we should try to involve the other side of the family too, who are not familiar with the Persian ceremony. It's, you know, so easy, like Bita Jun mentioned, to bring in your mother-in-law, you know, your bridesmaids to learn about this beautiful ritual. But when I officiate ceremonies, I make this part of it not too long, especially because some some ladies, you know, their arms will just get so tired. <laughs> so I just kind of limit this part to the getting the consent from the bride and groom. Uh-huh. I only have the ladies come hold the cloth and do this ritual during that part, not the entire ceremony. Were you ever involved in setting up the sofre as well in your experience with weddings? You know, I've started actually doing that more recently, moving into the other parts of the wedding work. And certainly now I do set up sofres as well. You know, the food elements, there are some foods that are decorative, highly symbolic, for example, the eggs. 
they symbolize fertility and you know there are certainly so many eggs on some of these sofras like 20 or 30 <laughs> eggs the other fruits the fresh fruits that are there they symbolize abundance and growth these are all things that we hope for the couple's life and marriage there's the the honey it's another sweet food to share for the couple in the hopes to bring sweetness to their life and marriage and honey is also traditionally represented like a love potion during the persian ceremony the bride and groom will give a taste of the honey to one another with their pinky fingers and we joke that the rules are no dripping and no biting because <laughs> uh, you know they will kind of tease and try to bite each other's pinkies you know depending on where a family is from within iran itself you know depending on what region they're from there are other foods that come into play especially during the rituals so honey is used by most iranians regardless of where you know their ethnic background is from but for example people who are from shiraz they also share a taste of yogurt yogurt represents sepid bakhti or sefid bakhti which is like a bright and light destiny that's so fun i love that Okay, so let's get to like the main food. I know Bita Jun has a fun story about Jabohir rice that you had at your wedding. Tell us about that. Sure. So one of the most traditional things that served at Persian weddings is the shirin polo or the jeweled rice, which is like a beautiful, very aromatic rice that has carrots and orange peel and dried fruits and nuts and on top of a pile of rice that has saffron. And it's such a beautiful, elegant dish. And it's one of my favorites. And so when we went to plan our wedding, we found out that the location where we wanted to have it in a, a particular club, they did not allow outside catering. We had to use their internal food. We really wanted to have it at this place. And so what we did was we taught the chef how to make shirin polo. So that was maybe my very first time of sharing a recipe, a Persian recipe. So we did actually get to have it. So that was pretty cool. How many Persian weddings have you been to, Nilu Jun? Professionally, I've been doing this for about close to 15 years. And, you know, I should say that, especially when, I, when I'm hired as an officiant, I only go officiate the ceremony, you know, stay for the signing of the documents and then leave soon after. So I do not stay for the entire celebration. When I do travel outside of the country or sometimes outside of the state, I might stay for the reception because... You know, I don't have anything else to do in the city, but my work is done after the ceremony and I leave. However, when I'm hired as a planner, then of course I'll be there throughout, you know, from the setup until after the breakdown. Yes, the food, as you mentioned, you know, entirely depends on, on venues and their restrictions. Uh, although most of them are now allowing, you know, if there's a specific dish that's very traditional to the wedding, they're allowing that to come in. And I've seen some very creative ways of serving that shirin polo, the jeweled rice. If a venue does not allow, you know, a Persian buffet to be present at the wedding, I think the most elegant way that I've seen this displayed was at a wedding in Washington, D.C., where... It was a sit-down dinner, and in addition to the main plate where the venue had provided, the jeweled rice was served individually in martini glasses for each of the guests. And it was so beautiful and just the right portion and just, you know, stood on its own as it should. But, you know, there's so many different ways of preparing, presenting the food at the weddings, it really depends on the family. Some families really want, you know, full Persian buffet. They see this as an opportunity to introduce, you know, all of their non-Persian friends to our food and culture. So they want as much variety as possible and as much as possible. And some people are, you know, they like the more subdued but elegant, you know, sit-down version where obviously you're limited in what your options are. Oh, the food is so, so good. But one thing I think, if you haven't been to a Persian wedding, you'll be going sometime in the future, hopefully, is to not go hungry and know that it can often be really late when you eat. So you've been a planner. I don't know if this is always the case or if there's modern new ways, but a lot of times there's dancing for quite some time 
before there's any food, there might be a little bit of appetizers or cucumbers or <laughs> some <laughs> finger food, but you need to have energy to dance. And this can be a very late event. Yes, you know, I think one of the main differences between Persian weddings and maybe Western weddings, as far as the scheduling of, of the event, is that Persian or non, after the ceremony, usually there's a cocktail hour and, you know, both Persians and, and Westerns have that. And then when you go into the reception, Persians like to, you know, go in with a bang. So <laughs> they enter the reception, you know, bride and groom and their bridal party, perhaps, and they go right into a dancing after maybe their first dance. They bring everyone up and there's a, you know, a lot of dancing and huge bang celebration getting everyone up to, you know, dance for maybe an hour or more. And then they go into, you know, getting a little quieter, maybe sitting down and getting to the dinner and the speeches and more dancing and all of that. Western weddings, they tend to enter the reception a little bit more subdued maybe than the Persian ones, but still fairly uh, enthusiastic. You know, they enter bride and groom and their bridal party, and then the bride and groom have their slow dance, usually, or, or their first dance. And after that, usually everyone gets seated, and they go into the dinner, and then the speeches, maybe another dance by the couple, the father daughter dance, mother son dance, those kinds of things. They might even, you know, serve the cake even after that. And then they get into the dancing. And the dancing is usually much shorter than it is in the Persian weddings. Yeah, dancing is definitely a big part of Persian weddings. Like, how much can you dance before the night is over? <laughs> it's like your feet hurt. You're like, okay. A lot of times that there will be a knife dance associated with the cake. <laughs> and it's so funny. I've only been to a couple with the knife dance. I don't really understand it. <laughs> What is happening with this like weird, sexy knife dance? What's the history of the knife dance, Neelu Jun? So I assume neither of you had it at your wedding? I didn't have it, no. I actually did have it at my wedding. Oh, you had it? <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of fun with it, actually. You know, to be honest, I don't know what like the history is. And now like maybe we should have researched it a little bit. But, you know, I've been to several Persian weddings where there's like a really big, elaborate, multi-layer, beautiful cake. But to be honest with you... I'm not that big of a cake person, so I didn't need to have this huge cake. So we had kind of like a more minimalist cake with pistachios and like these little dove figures on the top of it, which I loved. It was great. So we had like a knife and a server wrapped up with a pretty ribbon. And then different people took different turns, kind of dancing around with it a little bit. I think traditionally the groom is supposed to give money to the people dancing, took turns passing around. And so I'm not sure if there's more to the history of that. How about your husband? Was he okay with it too? When it got down to actually planning the wedding, it can be pretty overwhelming. And I was actually ready to just go to City Hall and just elope and be like, surprise, we're married now. But the more my husband learned about, oh, this sofre art, and it has all this symbolism and all these different meanings and all the support from your family and friends in the community and every part of the wedding that I would say to him, and I'm like, okay, this is the part, but I don't think we need that. He would be like, oh no, we have to have that oh no, we have to have that. That at the end, it wasn't like he was the groomzilla kind of in a way. But looking back, like it was an amazing evening that we had and I wouldn't want it any other way. But yeah, we did do a knife dance and we had fun with it. It can be fun. It gets everybody out there and dancing and involves everyone. We got to talk about food and fun parts about weddings and definitely want to have some time to talk about some of your more recent endeavors Neela Jun, what have you been up to around food recently? Almost a year ago now, in March, my last wedding took place because after that, it was the pandemic. Everything since then was either postponed or canceled. So I spent more and more time in the kitchen and I realized, wow, this is, you know, it's kind of helping me stay sane. And I also realized how much I love being around food. And I always cooked, of course, the, you know, most of my adult life. And I entertained a lot, as a lot of Iranian women do. So I, I was familiar with the kitchen and food and all of that stuff. But this time, this time of not working in my uh, own profession and this time of quietude, maybe during the past few months, I, I decided to put together a 
collection of our recipes, which uh, I published on Amazon, and it's called Nilu's 21 Recipes from a Shelter in Place. These were mainly foods that we prepared and ate during, especially during the lockdown period. These are either restaurant foods that we couldn't get because our favorite restaurants were closed. So we started trying them at home and perfecting them, or they were very healthy and immune boosting. Thank you so much for joining us today. We had so much fun talking about weddings and thank you so much, Nilu Jun. Thank you so much, ladies. Thanks again, Nilu Jun. For more information on Persian weddings, visit niluweddings.com. To find Nilu, you can reach out to her on Instagram. She has two handles, at Nilu Weddings and at Nilu Recipes. To learn more about her cookbook, please search 21recipes.com or order your own copy on Amazon, Nilu's 21 Recipes from a Shelter in Place by Nilu Nuri. If you'd like to be considered to be a future guest on our podcast, reach out to us on email or shoot us a message on Instagram. So you've been listening to Modern Persian Food with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling your friends or giving us a good rating on iTunes. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com for recipes and info that we talked about today. Thanks so much. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time. Oh,